Welcome back to the Wisdom Collective. I'm here with Trip Parker. Trip, um, I connected up with you over social media. I think the Twitter algorithm said we should talk, and so here we are. We're doing it. Uh, but I, I connected up. Um, I saw. I came across. I don't remember if someone shared it to me or what happened, but um, somehow I saw an article that you had published recently, um, where you were unpacking these ideas about how there's this. Uh, religious affection or this new religious undertone to so much of what we might call this, I don't know what we'd call it, this woke version of um, social justice that is mixed and sometimes helpful, but oftentimes unhelpful. And I think we're going to unpack a lot of that. But um, before we dive in there, do you want to explain to people who you are? Um, yeah. What, I mean, is this your first published piece or what are you up to? Or is this something you do regularly? No. Um, yeah. So, um, Background, um, I graduated from um, Duke um, uh, Bachelors of uh, Science and Engineering and Computer Science and Computer Engineering, but I also um, got a master's in philosophy while I was there. Philosophy of mind was the, the area of philosophy that I was really interested in. I also uh, took a bunch of courses at Reformed Theological Seminary in Charlotte. So philosophy and religion have always been really um, interesting to me. It doesn't pay the bills. Um, I'm, I'm a computer engineer. Um, You're talking by... to someone who works in theology. I get yeah, it. No. It's true. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know. I, I, I knew I, the one thing I knew when I went to college, I knew I wanted to major in philosophy, but my dad told me that they're not building philosophy factories anymore. And so I needed to get a, do something that I could actually get a job in. Okay. Um, and so, uh, but anyway, um, so yeah, philosophy of mind was my background, but philosophy and religion was always really interesting. Um, but philosophy of mind, so what I ended up going into was about, um, machine learning and artificial intelligence research for Microsoft and Amazon. And so I've been in that space for, you know, about 12 years now. Um, and so, uh, so that's, that's like kind of my day job, but, um, I, most of my, so most of my papers are, uh, you know, related to engineering um, patents and that kind of stuff. So some things that I've done there and Rick, academic quite interesting ac reads. <laughs> no, not, not, <laughs> not unless you're an engineer. Uh, no, they're, they're not. They're they're pretty dry um, and and ten intentionally obfuscating a lot of times. Um, <laughs> but uh, but then I, I have some research papers that I published. Um, I, I published um, uh, with one of my friends, Al Erisman, who's a former head of um, research and development at Boeing. Um, he and I published a. Um, uh, it's called Artificial Intelligence, a Theological Perspective. So that was, a, that was published in a peer-reviewed journal um, last year, I think. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm getting more in, I'm, I'm crossing away from doing just pure engineering stuff and more theology and philosophy again. And I'm getting, and now I'm getting into the cultural critique because it's becoming, it's just all, it's like all encompassing. You can't get away from it now. It's, it's, it's it, all intertwined in every way. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's one of those things where you're just like, okay, you can't, no longer can we have esoteric theological debates, you know, uh, like in these little enclaves because it's on Twitter and it's in front of everything and it's infecting everything. You can't have a conversation. You can't have a, you can't even watch a movie now without talking about some of this stuff. And so I'm starting to do more of that. So um, this is my first kind of popular piece, I would say, that's not like a peer reviewed journal or an academic publication. Um, was my federalist piece and so yeah it's a you know I, I call it you know the religion of the woke they're seeking um they're seeking it's a religion without atonement uh, they don't have a mechanism for it which is where i think a lot of the unhealthy behavior that you observe going on online with like cancel culture and that kind of thing it's, mm -hmm. it's a seeking of atonement that's what they're looking for so that was my thesis and that's why i wrote the piece yeah well i want to unpack a lot of that because you um you can tell you have <laughs> well you're smarter than than me that's for sure you've got more degrees and you're obviously but you're more well-rounded too i mean and it shows honestly in this piece here where the, the one that you had published at the popular level it's it's well sourced and resourced and i mean you're talking about jonathan Haidt and people from inside and outside the church and just you're you're really pulling together a lot of things in an interesting way um yeah because it's it, i was talking to someone about actually your article and that the idea being that there is this popular level conversation that happens. And I think you cite some of those conversations at the beginning of your article, um, where there are people who are from outside the church that say they're either agnostic or atheist perspectives in philosophy, um, or any, especially the hard sciences with Brett Weinstein and others, you know, um, and they talk about um, the faith elements of this kind of wokish movement that's happening. 
Um, yeah. But they're doing it from an, a perspective of outside the church. And the way they talk about religion is sometimes, sometimes they're spot on, but sometimes it's like, oh, you don't even know a single religious no, person. Yeah. Sometimes you know you're I mean? like, you would only say that if you weren't in the church, if you did not grow up in it, like you're making pretty basic mistakes a lot of times. Yes, exactly. And that's what was interesting for, for your article is that you were, you were taking a similar um, line of argument that this has a faith element to it um, and some of its worst forms, especially. Um, but you were doing it with the language. You obviously could speak the language, right? So um, let's unpack some of that. Um, you mentioned um, that this is more or less a religion that is seeking atonement. Um, what do you mean by that? Uh, explain that. Yeah, so it has, I mean, it, I, I'm, not, you, I, I'm not the first one to notice. Uh, you know, uh, John McWhorter has written a bunch on this, um, you know, in the Atlantic and everything. Like how, uh, you know, James Lindsay, for, he calls it a cult all the time. So there's, it's, it's easy to... I'm not the first to point out that like, hey, this looks like a religion, right? It has rites and liturgies and myths and all this kind of stuff. So in a lot of ways, the things that we, that we would characterize or we would associate with religion, it has. It doesn't have the, the, the supernatural claims a lot of times, but like every, the praxis around it just looks so familiar. It looks so much like a religion. Um, and so uh, one of the big characteristics, though, of a religion is this idea of of, you know, they don't, again, they don't have the supernatural order. It's almost like an unspoken one, but you have this like higher order that you're not living up to, right? You, there's something that's wrong with you. There's something you need from this higher order. And so the idea is I've got to make myself right with it, right? And so that, that's where the idea of sacrifice comes in. I need to sacrifice something to make myself right with this cosmic order that's around me. Um, and this way that I've kind of erred, I've gone off off the rails a little bit and there is and so like the, a sin uh, a sin narrative of sorts in that right yeah uh, oh totally i mean uh, I read a, robin d'angelo and white fragility like it, like right. there there's an original sin here um that that you have to deal with and so and and the white fragility thing is just one aspect of it there's gender there's race there's you know all this kind of stuff that like kind of intertwines but there is this like sin this idea that there's a dirtiness to me right there, there's a, there's a problem with me um, and, and I'm, I'm hurting people and I'm, you know, society is worse because of it and all this kind of stuff. Right. And, and there's some higher level thing that I should be, that I'm not. Mm -hmm. So I need to, how do, so, okay. I've, I've got two problems then. I've got one problem is, um, you know, there's gotta be payment for these sins. Right. And then I need a way of being better going forward. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like uh, there's, so then you get into the anti-racism thing. Like, well, how do I make myself good going forward? Well, you engage in anti-racism stuff and you read these books and you volunteer here and you know, you, you, you march in protests, you do all this kind of, you, you're an activist, mm -hmm. right? That's what, and that's kind of like the acolyte version of this. Like you have to become an activist. Okay, fine. Let's, and that's let's, like the, that's the, the true believer, so to speak. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so let, I mean, let's even take like, you know, some of the listeners might even, you know, take like activist sounds like derogatory or something like that. Let's say, okay, but I'm not even saying like you can be an activist for a good cause too. So like, let's just be completely neutral about what it is. But the version of becoming a good member of this new church is to become an activist. That That is what it is. And so mm -hmm. just like we would say, you're a Christian or you're an activist for these causes. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. But then I have another problem. The other problem is that what about my past sins? What about all the stuff that I've done in the past? I can't undo them. Right. Say I said something racist to someone or, or something like that, or, or I, I unintentionally had a microaggression or whatever it is. I've got all this stuff, this baggage that's with me. How do I fix it? Right. And so, you know, a lot of religions have the sacrifice idea. That's where, like, in order to pay and become right with the universe, I've still got to do stuff going forward, but I've got to pay for the past, too. Yeah. And so I, I bring offerings and sacrifices and I do that. Right. And sometimes in human history, that was animal sacrifices or human sacrifices or burnt offerings of incense or whatever it is, but we're making it right. Like we're paying something. Okay. Well, we don't do animal sacrifices and human sacrifices, right? Like explicitly now that doesn't really fit in with our, our narrative. And the problem with the human sacrifice and the animal sacrifice is that you have to keep doing it. Yes. Right. It does, it's not like a one-time thing. You go to the temple every year to do this kind of thing. You, you know, you, you make a journey to Mecca. You, 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 do, you have to do these things, right? And you have to do them regularly um, because you're continually sinning. Um, and that's part of the, the Christian vision and narrative is, is just that in whoever the author was in the book of Hebrews. I mean, the point is that, that this is a, this is a continual uh, ritualistic 
um, every year thing in part because in, in some sense, you need some kind of a totalizing sacrifice, right? Right, exactly. Uh, and that's I mean, what and that's, price is supposed and, to be. And if you go back to, I think it was Micah 6, right? And so it's like, what what does the Lord require to you except to love justice, you know, um, be humble, I love justice, and uh, and walk humbly with your God. But the problem is um, none of us can do that, yeah. right? And so it's like, what do, what, do you re- what do you require of us, God? And, and God, you know, do you require like, you know, rivers of olive oil, lots of sacrifices? And it says, well, God's told you what he wants. He wants you to be humble and be kind and those kind of things. And so like it lists says, and walk humbly with your God. Okay, but I can't do that. So I'm back to the rivers of olive oil at offering and I'm yeah. back to the sacrifices. We have to return to those things that we asked God and that's what he wanted. And he says, that's not what I want at all. I want these other things, but you can't give him that. Okay, so we gotta, we're going back to the sacrifice and it's going to be yeah. continual. The problem is, is that so there's obvious issues with this. So now we've got the sacrifice that I have to keep giving over and over and over. Well, okay, that's obviously not, that's obviously a problem. Um, you, you can't just keep doing that. And it doesn't really feel like you're actually atoning for your sins when you do it. Like, do you really feel like that lamb that you just sacrificed on the altar if you're in, you know, an ancient Israelite? Is that really making you right with God? Well, obviously not, because Micah is pointing out that it's not making you right with God, really. Yeah, um, and wants, so yeah, the Christian theology. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And so that's where the Christian story comes in. And so now we have this one perfect person, the God man, who came, who was perfect, and was the sacrifice, a sacrifice that was big enough to encompass all of our sins and relieve us of this necessity to keep coming and offering more sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Um, Christianity is kind of the only religion that gives you that um, that one time payment, as it were. Okay, and that's one of the reasons that you know it it's it's appealing to people because no one wants that burden. That burden's right. awful. Um, I, I think there's a story by and the burden uh, about, and the burden's real. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. It's totally yeah. real. It's, it's real for even it's real for especially the more pious you are, the more like the more aware of your own sin you are, mm-hmm. the more that burden can be crushing. Um, I think there's a there, it might be apocryphal. I don't know, but there's a story of Martin Luther. Where you know he he's at this point he's a he's a um, he's a, a priest in the Catholic Church or I think he was an acolyte or something like that he was being taught, um, and um, so he was going back he would get in go get in line go into confession to confess his sins to the priest and then he would get out of line and so after he was done he would get back in line, and then go and do it again, and the priest finally was like what are you doing he's like well by the time I got to that line I'd already sinned. Or by the time I I remembered something else that I send about, and, and so whatever. So he thinks that this this confession to him became kind of like that that atone. I I've got to atone for this. I've got to go and do it. And so the confession was how it says we're being forgiven at this point. And so you know I lo- and he said I love God so much I want to be right with him. And so the priest said at the end like finally the priest got exasperated and said you don't love God you hate him <laughs> because it's a crushing burden right yeah. you hate, how could you love a God that's going to do that right? Yeah. So anyway, so that's setting the stage. So now we've got this new religion um, and, you know, they, they need to atone for their past sins, these, these activists, but they can't do it. They don't have the sacrifice mechanisms and that kind of stuff. So they do it. My hypothesis is that they do it essentially by canceling people, by finding heretics or finding people who are bad, um, who aren't sharing their activism and that kind of stuff. And then it becomes like a you know, a social media version of burning at the stake. We've got to, you know, and so you do that as like a way of showing how much of an activist you are, like just how good um, you are. Um, And so it becomes, it becomes this thing that you can't, um, you can't, you can't not do. It's the way that you're becoming right. And, and you get the social aspect of other people um, encouraging you in that, right? Because now, oh, yes. you found this really racist thing and you called him out and he lost his job and all this kind of stuff. And so it becomes like, oh yeah, I am a good activist. And so it becomes a self-reinforcing mechanism where this this sacrificing other people um, becomes your way of sacrificing to this cosmic order that you don't think you're right with. So that's the hypothesis is, is that this is this is like kind of the motivation behind a lot of these people is that they think that by doing this, they're being good. This is a good thing to do. And this is like helping it's like atone for their past sins of being racist um, is by sacrificing racist today, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like, that's how you balance the scales and you get the, you know, the red off of your ledger. 
Um, so yeah, that, that's the hypothesis for those who haven't read the, we should probably put a link in the description. Um, we will, that for was, sure. That, that's, yeah. that's probably the, the high, that was, that's the thesis that I had. Yeah. And there's a, there's a lot to unpack there for sure. Cause there's a, there is a feedback loop like you talked about where it becomes self-reinforcing, I think is the way you put it, but basically, yeah, I mean, it's, um, the, the social currency is such that, you know, we're, we're social animals. I believe you yep. talked about this with the hype part that you get into. We're social animals and we do have, I don't know if you say it like this, but we have hierarchies we're trying to achieve. Like we're trying to be the best version of whatever group we're in, you know? So if yep. the version is like woke activism, we're trying to be the best version of that. And so we're trying to climb that hierarchy with and attain social currency, so to speak, which is through mutual praise and respect and whatever. Right. Um, but man, the, the, the it's way even that present you in the Christian is, church, right? We talk about like yes. the qualifications for elders and deacons, right? Well, he has to be well thought of in the community, you know, above reproach, that kind of thing. Like yeah. we, like even as Christians who have this one time atonement, still use the social cues. It's not yes. like we got around them. Um, you know, it's just that they're not they're not of eternal value or, or they're not the eternal thing. But yes. without without anything that's fixed, anything that's eternal and clear, then all you have is the social cues. Yes. And you know, that's the what what other barometer is there for you to use? Yeah. No, and it, right, exactly. You, you and there's this is getting a little well, you'll be able to hang here and hopefully the listeners don't get bored with this part. Um but there's something like deeply philosophical about that idea you're talking about that within, you mentioned earlier, the God, man, Christ, right? That that's part of the idea of who Jesus is, is this fully human and fully divine. Philosophically speaking, you know, he is then objective truth and subjective truth at the same time, basically. Right. Yeah. So he's, he's objective truth in this vertical sense being horizontally realized, right? Which is a fascinating idea. It right. feels like a, an oxymoron or an impossibility, but he's, he's harmonizing two things that we often put attention and that is what's interesting when I look at, so there's this, there's a, there is a woke religious version of things that is outside the church, but there is a, a Christianized version of it. I think part of the reason why it comports over into the church so easily or so well at times is because this is, I mean, you were, you were framing it well as a religious movement. I've heard it framed as essentially like a Christian heresy or a neo Gnosticism of some sort. Um, but it's it has very like similar. Tentacle. It's very similar, and I think that's why actually the Christian Church, especially the kind of the mainline Protestant um, Christian Church, have been so susceptible to it. Mm -hmm. I think that I think I read today that um, Robin D'Angelo has been hired by the United Methodist Church to right. um, to produce you know content for them on how to be an anti-racist or deal with white fragility and talk about it and that kind of thing. I think that's why it's so it's so susceptible is because it it's it's utilizing a lot of the same mechanisms that Christians are very familiar with. Um, and it's, it's like a virus in that way. It's like hijacking, you know, the yes. cells to produce something that they weren't meant to produce. Um, and that's very much what I see this as It's kind of like it, they're hijacking a lot of the good mechanisms that the church has to produce things that are not meant to be produced by the church. Yeah. It's, it's got, um, exactly right it's got it's got repentance without absolution there's no like ultimate forgiveness there's no yep. uh but there but is it's a got requirement repentance and to... people want to repent right yes. so that's why it's appealing that's how the virus gets in is that people want to repent this is a good motivation right i mean yeah. um people want people want to be compassionate people do see people suffering right i mean there is racism it's not like that doesn't absolutely exist. And so the same thing with gender, there is sexism. It's not like that doesn't exist. And so people, is, especially even Christians maybe, want to do something about that. And if they participated and they want to repent of this. And so it's, it's hijacking that and kind of redirecting it in this non-Christian way that that's the part that bothers me. But I get the motivation. The motivation makes total sense to me. And it's even a good one. Right, right. Yeah, we shouldn't take away from that. I want to um, kind of uh, end there in our conversation and trying to figure out, okay, so what's the best, best things we can see here? Not necessarily with the ideology, because I don't know that, I think we should be able to call things that are deeply dehumanizing and community destroying just evil, because that is yeah. like the definition of sin, in my opinion. But so at the level of the ideology, I'm fine calling that evil, but the people getting sort of uh, tangled up in it, how do we like call them back or call them out of that, right? So I want to go there yeah. eventually, but before we do that, um, yeah, let's just keep going with this idea here um, with the 
So we talked about like the objective and subject of being fully realized in Christ and Christ is the ideal, right? He's the ideal human in some respects. Uh, well, not in some respects, in every respect, but, <laughs> but for us on the other side of him and, and for the Christian, the idea is to live your life, not only out of the forgiveness that you have in him, but to live your life truly in him. Like yeah. when God looks down, he sees Christ, right? Cause you are in union through this spirit. It, you, it feels heretical or strange to say but you are in a participation with the trinity in some sense right yeah and so anyway there is i think that's another one of these deeply human desires but a tension that comes up in the version of this outside of the church and inside is that i would argue i know he wasn't saying this triumphantly but nietzsche like has that parable that he writes right where he talks about like god is dead and we have killed him and it's this somber yeah. thing and it's sad because for a lot of reasons, but the main reason is our meeting making structures are going to be gone if we get rid of God. And his hope is that we would self actuate new meaning making structures, right? Um, but what ends up happening is people just replace the God with some other God and it is outside of themselves. And I really do think that for a lot of the Christians that are getting swept up into this, um, where I can blame the churches, we haven't articulated for them or give them a very good live theology, like a theology for their life. Maybe we spoke a lots of pure doctrine to their head, but we haven't articulated to them what that means for the seven days a week. So I'll take some fault there with the church. But the negative is, is that a place where they've found in America, especially lived theology is through politics, right? That is, yeah. that is the new God, so to speak. And to speak contemporarily, like that's so much of the reason why I believe the, the moral panic exists as it does right now, is you've got so many people whose gods are failing them. And that's terrifying. That's chaos inducing. Not only is chaos happening from the outside, from without in this, let's say with this virus, we're in COVID right now in 2020, you can't see it, you've got elections coming up, but all of your gods that are supposed to be absolving, fixing, calming like the chaos and the waves are just failing you in every direction, right? Yeah. So, I mean, the economy, just, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. mammon is failing you, everything's failing you, right? Um, mm -hmm. And meanwhile, you have no like local, real in-person community that's there to kind of be a buttress against some of these things. So things that would normally be, um, things that would normally be destabilizing just generally, um, you know, like a pandemic or an economic collapse or whatever it is, like those things, no matter what happens, a healthy church, unhealthy church, you know, good, generally okay nation, not okay nation. Um, it doesn't really matter. That's going to be painful, right? That's going to destabilize yeah. some things. But hopefully you have like, you, you have like an in-person local community um, and family structures and some of those institutions that can be a buttress against that. And then you have a faith that's kind of transcendent, that's not so dependent on what's happening right now. Um, that that gives you a, a broader perspective and you can, you can, you can weather it that way, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think that there's... Um, uh, there's another article that I have in mind, um, and it's that uh, the idea is that um, you can. Uh, I'm I'm calling it uh, who um, matters more than what, um, and the idea is that you know there's something that someone does to me that I may not understand, right? So like maybe my my boss is giving me feedback um, that I don't fully agree with, or I don't really you know I don't think it's fair or whatever. Okay. Or your wife is doing something that you don't like, or your, you know, your parents, your friends, whatever it is, whoever you have this other thing. Okay. And that, that thing you, from your perspective might be awful, right? It might be really painful for you to, to go through that. Um, but if you trust the who on the other side of it, you can endure any of the what's right. Like yeah. what it is. Like if I trust this person, if I trust my boss that he's not trying to mess up my career or whatever, by giving me this feedback or giving me a bad performance review, whatever, but I have trust in him, then I can, I can make navigate this trickier water. Same thing with your wife. If, if you trust your wife, then you can endure a lot of like the criticisms and, and arguments and things that you just have to, you're going to go through in your life. It's the same yeah. thing with going, going yeah. through life. Yeah. If you're a Christian and you trust the who on the other side of it that you think is nor is actually in control, if you trust God, the who, mm -hmm. then you can endure the what. You may not understand it. You may not hate it. You may, you know, you you might write lamentations and psalms like that was a lot of David, right? You could tell that there's a what there that's really painful, but there's a who there that David does end up trusting. Um, you can do that. Here's my concern with these people, though. It, you know, when we're doing this, is we're removing the who. There's no who here anymore. There's just the what. 
And I don't know how you navigate that. I, I mean, when, when pandemics hit or econ- like, yeah, your gods are failing you because they're not, there's no who. There's no one to trust in, really. Yes. There was just like this idea that my activism was going to create utopia or whatever. Like that, that, that idea is what I was trusting in, but that idea is foolish, right? Yeah. And so, um, so anyway, so that's another article that I have that I have in mind. But and similar to this is that yeah, I think I agree with you that these people's gods are failing them because their gods aren't gods at all. <laughs> their their ideas, their their figments of their imagination. Yeah, yeah, they they are mythologies, exactly right, and yeah. and and not that all myth is, I think that word gets a bad rap in some respects because yeah. myth can speak to true things, but yeah, the the imagination, whether it's for nostalgia of a years past that's imagined and it's rosy and all the rest, the rose colored glasses, right, or um, the imagination of a future utopia um, that is impossible with human beings involved, um, both exactly, their their foundation is deeply mythological. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, and in the impossible sense. And yeah. so something you're talking about there in the who and the what though, it's, I think you're onto something because that seems like, it seems like the reason why things get so charged. Uh, well, Haidt talks about with Lukianoff actually in that coddling of the American mind. He talks about, we move from the common humanity to the common enemy um, swing of things. And you might call that third wave civil rights even. Like first wave civil rights might be right. like, emancipation and slave trade uh, and even civil war which other countries did it without a physical war but that's beside the point the um, but the point being that's kind of first wave you know yeah. uh, civil rights second wave would obviously be our 50s 60s 70s movements right um, and then now we're in this sort of third wave form which is well yeah and that's just on the race side right there's uh, obviously feminism as well and other movements um, right they, they, but I think a lot of us could find a green Fundamentally, with... the praxis between like the feminists, like the gender equality and racial equality, like fundamentally the praxis is exactly the same. Like replace some words and we're talking about the exact same thing, right? Yes. It's the same kind of hysteria. Um, and so I, I think in America, we've married politics and a religion like in a really unhealthy way. So, so like every election, it's like the end of the world. Like our eschatology is totally messed up if our guy doesn't win or this doesn't happen and that kind of stuff because there's no who. Right. Yes. I, 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 there's no who that we're trusting in there that's actually in control. It's like, no, if I don't do this, the, you know, the conservatives don't get their guy in or the, the progressives don't get their guy in. Then like it's the end of America as we know it and that kind of stuff. And it just becomes, I don't know, like it just it's really unhealthy. Right. You can't live yes. like that. I and mean, this is why you see Twitter. And it's just like, a, a, you know, I'm sure I'm not like a great contributor to it, but it, generally I just don't walk away. I just feel like how people would like they get on there in order to be angry. Um, and, yeah. and I know that they walk away and they're just angry all day about it. And you're like, okay, I get on there and I have some fun with it, but I'm not angry at the end of the day about what I read. Like I, there's a who that I'm trusting in and it's not, it's not our political process. That's not my who. Right. So that's, yeah. that's where, I, that's another thing that's missing in this, um, in this entire thing. It's there's no, I don't know how, you can't atone for your sins. And so you're, you're, you have this social impetus to just like, you know, set people on fire at the stake metaphorically. And there's no hope. There's no like inevitability about the future. There's no, there's no, there's no one in charge. No one's at the wheel. And so we're all fighting over the wheel um, Mm -hmm. constantly. And, you know, if our guy doesn't win, then our eschatology is messed up. There will be no heaven on the other side of it and after this election, after 2016, and now 2020. And it'll keep happening so long as we keep believing it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That if playing the same game will not get us out of it, that's for sure. No. That's for sure. Well, you're getting onto something that's, I think, helpful. Um, and that, that is, well, two things. One, so much of this manifests itself on social media. And earlier you were talking about almost a hyper sort of a hyper individualism and the dissolving of community. A lot of times these things could and would be addressed. Any one of these things and not um, just tensions, but just chaos that happens in your life would be addressed at the level of community, family, et cetera. But we've sort of dissolved real community for faux versions of it in social yeah. media. Right. And that is where a lot of this um, charging and rhetoric and emotion is cashing out. Um, and, and, and not just emotion, but action even. I mean, sometimes people will make a big deal about how, well, you're not actually getting burned at the stake, so it's not so big. And it's like, you're talking livelihood here. You're talking like permanent reputation here. You're talking like very real stuff. 
that uh, I, mean, I don't that know really what, how I don't know how you can look at things like the opiate crisis and the suicide rate spikes mm-hmm. and think in this country and think oh no that everything's fine yes. right like, like th- these people are so distraught that they're either using drugs to slowly kill themselves or they're just outright killing themselves like uh, suicide rates among like teenage girls is crazy high it is it's like quadrupled in like five years 400 crazy yeah yeah Yeah. and so you're like oh well you're not literally being burned at the stake i was like okay but like these people are hurting so much that they're willing to kill themselves Mm -hmm. so like don't this this kind of thing frustrates me where people want to rank emotions and rank bad experiences and that kind of stuff i really hate that it'd be as condescending as saying you know, and I've heard this. I grew up in the South, so I've heard things like this. White people tell black people, well, be glad you're not back in Africa, right? Things are worse there, right? You should be Jeez. glad that your ancestors came over here. It's a <laughs> yeah, horrible yeah. thing to say, obviously. Right. Um, right. But we know that that's odd. We look at that and be like, oh, you're just, you know, you'd be like, okay, that doesn't make them feel better. Even say that's true. Even say, like, Barack Obama's daughters are better off being in America than they would have been. In it. Okay. Does that mean that they don't experience racism ever? Yeah, no. Like, Does that mean that that experience dismissal. is pleasant for them or anything else like that? That's ridiculous. Yeah. And so stack ranking emotions and bad experiences and things that are legitimately wrong is not helpful. Um, and so saying, yeah, it could be worse. It could always be worse. That doesn't mean it's good. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's not real to that person. This is like a, this is very infantile thinking about what's going on with people. And you know what? One of the things that drives suicide rate, I believe, isn't even how bad the thing is that the person's going through. It's the belief that no one cares how bad it is yes. for them. Like there's a reason that 40 year old white men are like the highest suicide rate group. It's because no one cares. Like, uh, no one ca- socioeconomically and all the rest, all of the factors that we're told. At least you're a white male. From- at least you're a white male. And so right. like, well, yes. And so like, even if they're, pro- even if my grant that their problems on average aren't as bad as being whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact is, is that if, if you're constantly told no one cares about what's going on with you, that your you problems aren't really it. that yeah. You start believing it or you just despair, right? You're now you're feeling lonely. Now you don't have that social um that social help um to, to get you through it and so that's that's where anyway so that, that's just an aside that i this is just deeply unhelpful to to go about things that way and talk about oh well it could be worse You're like oh, okay that's that's ridiculous yeah well and it's 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 um it's frustrating you said like you hate it i would agree like to a degree i do because it's that sentiment because on the one hand, like I could grant, like you were, I think in a different way, I could grant, like, of course it, it could be worse, but it doesn't mean this is still, this is therefore not bad. Like it no. may not be as bad as possible, but it still sucks or it's still not good, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I want to, um, but the, I think that sentiment as well, like I hate that. And I, and I see so much of that somewhat interpersonally, but mostly online, right? Where the interpersonal is broken down and the walls are up, you know, it's like yeah. getting in your car and being okay with, thinking terrible thoughts or saying terrible things about the person next to you, as opposed to if you're in the grocery, Uh, the same goes for when you have this digital wall between you. So here's the deal, Trip. you're writing some interesting things here. We're talking about some interesting topics that intersect with faith, the church, this other version of religion, all these things. How do we address all of this without um, just becoming like monsters ourselves, like without hating people, you know what I mean? Because I can hate ideas, um, but sometimes those ideas are deeply embedded in a person's philosophy or their religion. So how do I approach this stuff and talk about it and address it in a way where I'm not hating a person? Because it's sometimes the two are so close together, it's hard to differentiate. right? Right. So how do you avoid that? Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's a really good question. I think, I mean, a couple of things. One is to, to remind yourself that the reason this person is doing it the reason that a lot of these things are appealing is that um, there are some good things there, right? There, this person probably does really care about racism. Probably, probably really does care about gender equality. These are good things. No one's like, like that's, these are genuine desires that this person has. There's a reason that they feel guilty. There's a reason that they want to repent and atone and do all these kind of things. Mm-hmm. Um, these are good desires. These are good desires that God's given us. And, um, and we shouldn't shy away from 
Um, we shouldn't shame people for them. They can be expressed in really unhealthy ways. In that way, they're they're like they're like emotions, right? God mm -hmm. gave us, uh, you know, um, if fear is an emotion that I have. It's a useful one. Um, you know, if I wasn't afraid of anything, um, then I would not survive very long in this world, right? Same thing with like you know the loneliness. Same thing with sadness. Same thing with happiness. These are all emotions, like base emotions that we have and they're good, but they can also be unhealthy um, and they can be exaggerated and they become all encompassing and debilitating and really unhealthy. And so that's what I would say, like note that this, like fear is a good one and it can be completely crippling to you if you let it go too far and you, you express it in healthy ways. And so I think that's the first thing is just to recognize that there's some, there's, there's good things that like that virus has hijacked a good cell mm -hmm. in some ways. Like the, the, the person's desires here are good um, at base, like those base ones. And their impulses, like their, their instincts are good. I need to atone for this. This is good. You should look for atonement for your sins. Um, in some ways, that's very healthy. Um, but you can do it in unhealthy ways. And at the point that you're sacrificing people's careers or even go back to the Aztecs, literally sacrificing people, this is bad. Um, and we, we can call that bad while also saying, you know, the people have good motivation. They want to be right with, with whatever it is that they see it as higher than them. I would say, I don't think they have a good idea of what's higher than them. And I can say, because of that, they don't know how to atone. And so they're latching onto the thing right in front of them and they're getting social reinforcement for doing so. Um, and so that's where it becomes really unhealthy and unhelpful. So that would be the first thing that I would do. And the second thing I would do is to show grace because a lot of these people are going to end up getting kicked out of their own movement. Um, right. the, like in some ways the, the snake eats his own tail here. And so in my federalist piece, that's why I ended it like talking about Jimmy Kimmel and saying like, there's a better way. Right. And so, because at some point they might come for Jimmy Kimmel, um, at well, some they point are they are actually after exactly. Like they, so I mean, he just went on his sabbatical more or less, I would exactly. assume Thank in light of that. And so what we should do, I, honestly, what we should do for those people is to reach out and show them grace that it doesn't have to be this way. Right. They don't, you know, they, there's no, they do not need to, to, you know, be a part of this unhealthy version uh, of Christianity or just unhealthy religion in general. They can be part of a healthy one. Um, and here's the, another article that I have, that I'm thinking about. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's working on the ideas of uh, Rene Girard um, and, um, you know, uh, mimetic violence, right? Yeah. And so the idea is, you know, for those who haven't read any Girard is, you know, um, humans are social creatures and we mimic each other. Um, we, if we see someone wanting something, it makes us want it. If we see someone doing something, it makes us want to do it. Um, and, and it can be self-reinforcing this mimesis. Right. And so it, and that's where medic violence can come in that it keeps escalating. So I was going to talk about, for instance, the statue toppling as one example of mimetic violence. It started off with, you know, Confederate statues, which for my money, that makes total sense. I don't know why we have those. It's, yeah, it's arguably no. like, I mean, there might be a better way to go about it, but no one's like saying. Or, For sure. No There's a better Hardly, way of going about it. But. That's the only debatable point people have, though. It's not like, well, the, I like, I mean, there are people, but it's a minority view at this point. They're like, I actually like that statue. Right, like, exactly. you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So, so we can start that, but here's the thing. There's no limiting principle that was ever articulated yeah. for where do we draw the line between just forcibly like knocking over statues and which ones, you know, what, mm -hmm. what's our line? Is it, is it just traitors? Are we just doing it for with traitors? Okay. But that was never articulated. It was a moral thing. These guys were bad guys. So we're on top of them. Well, okay. Jefferson owned slaves. So did Washington. So now we got the founders. Now we got Lincoln. Lincoln said some pretty unsavory things about slaves. What about Martin Luther King? He said some like he's got some about women, women problems. Oh yeah, dude. And so yeah. like you're like okay, so this is but this is an example. Like whatever you think about any individual one of those, this is clearly an example of mimetic violence where we see someone doing something and it makes us want to do it, and then we keep one upping each other and we keep we keep going um, with it. And so so anyway, so we have this idea of mimetic violence, but mimetic mimetic behavior can go the other way too. Um, yes, it's not yes, just yeah. the bad stuff that gets mimicked. If we see someone being kind and generous and loving, it makes us want to be kind and generous and loving. And so this was Jesus's entire point. And, and like, it, like, 
just be like me, be kind and loving and self-sacrificial, do that. And it makes other people want to do it. And so you can start that kind of cycle too. And so first, yeah, call the ideas bad if they're bad ideas, a hundred percent. And we need smart people doing that. Yeah. But on a personal level, know that where this person is coming from, some of this, the core functions of the cell are good ones and doing exactly what they were, you know, they're, they're motivating for a reason. Um, but then secondly, like show them a better way, um, personally, like give them something else to mimic other than just what they're getting, because they're getting the social reinforcement of what they're doing. And so it becomes this ever escalating mimetic behavior. It can go the other way too. Um, and I think Christians are the best ones because we have the best example of how to do that, to, to give them a different view of it. So that would be my second pitch of what, how Christians should, um, should uh deal with this is just show them a better way they're gonna a lot of these people are gonna get kicked out and eventually everyone's gonna get i i honestly think eventually people are gonna just be like i don't want to live like this anymore and if you see another group of people living differently you're like oh that's so nice like i yeah. it's so like the burden the toxic like burden the constant guilt and that kind of stuff we don't have to live that way i want to know more about that and mm -hmm. so then you give them something else to mimic so that would be my second um my second point i think that's well, I, I'm excited to read that article when you get it published out, dude. That's going to be really good. That because that's a tension, like, and but it's a good tension, honestly. Like, MLK is one of my biggest heroes, and in, uh, in life, but in the faith, especially, um, especially because, and maybe it's just if I lived in a different era, it'd be less of this. But that idea of not just enemy love with your mind, not just oh, I love that person, you know, I forgive him in my head, but I won't forget their sin and stuff. It's like, no, he practiced this radical forgiveness that was willing to forgive and willing to to love, even like a violent oppressor at times, you know, and they had to train for it though, because they knew how impossible that was. But he's a man in tension because he also has this unsavory life when it comes to like women, let's say, and stuff. And I have to figure out how do I still uh look up to this man? And and you but that's like, I don't, his sins had real consequences. So I don't mean this in a, For sure. a weird way, and, but, and I'm not but it almost not... made him more of a, an honest hero, you know, yeah. because he wasn't well, fakely pure. He had, no, he, had he wasn't. Yeah. yeah. And, and well, this is the thing, like it, we're going to topple any statue that we put up as if we're, if we're putting, if we're going to do that. Right. I mean, we, I don't think that we should gloss over or whitewash it. Mm -hmm. um, what's going on. I think there's a place for talking about some of those things. Um, but I also think that in, in some of these cases, we also have to like judge them for who they were at the time, because here's the thing. None of us are trans, like almost none of us transcend the morality of our time. Almost all of us, like we practice, like the people are going to look back. I I'm, I'm quite confident in like 200 years and look and look at what we're doing with say factory farming, for instance, and say, yep. what on earth were you guys doing? Yeah. Right. And here's the thing. Almost all of us were going along with it. Yep. Almost all of us. And that's, that's what most people do. So what's, what's norm, like what's extraordinary to me, isn't like looking at Martin Luther King and be like, Oh yeah, he had some bad views on women. He said some bad things. He did some bad things. Honestly, like it's like, yeah, I'm sure he did. I'm sure he had a lot of other flaws that we don't even know about. Here's the thing. In at least one area, he was able to transcend the morality of his time yes. and be something better that moved the needle forward. And almost none of us will do that. Right. Almost none of us will ever be remembered that way. Um, and because we're not doing it, almost all of us are moral when it's convenient to be moral um, and not when it's not. And what society lets us get around with, right? And so... Um, so anyway, and that's actually, I don't know if you're a comic book fan, but that was Joker in, you know, yes. The Dark Knight, you know, like these, these people, morality is a joke. They're only as good as society allows them to be. Mm -hmm. And some people like Martin Luther King were, were moral in ways society didn't allow them to be. Yeah. And it's amazing. And so like, I don't, you know, I would say the same thing for Washington. I would say the same thing for Jefferson. Like they did great things. Perfect. No, but honestly, we wouldn't have been either had we been living there. Mm -hmm. um, had we not grown up with, you know, 21st century morals, we wouldn't have this view on race if we grew up 150 years ago. That, uh, almost none of us would. Um, speaking of um, another, another, I don't know if you, um, so I, I read this letter um, that um, Frederick Douglass wrote to his um, former um, yeah. uh, uh, master that he escaped from. And he ends the, he ends the letter with this. I, I entertain no malice towards you personally. 
There's no roof under which you would be more safe than mine. And there's nothing in my house which you might need for your comfort, which I would not readily grant. Indeed, I should esteem it a privilege to set you an example as how mankind ought to treat each other. That would be my pitch of how to like, how to argue with these people. Like, no, like we can call out the ideas and that kind of stuff, but it, if it starts with vitriol, that's a mimetic violence and an escalation that's gonna go the other way. All we're gonna do is condemn each other more. And the problem right now is that we're condemning each other without any idea of how to atone for our sins. Mm -hmm. So let's just show each other grace um and and go at it that way and i call ideas stupid too and um but and that's you know to a certain extent that's fine but these are people um that you're dealing with and the only way that we're going to get out of this is by carving a different path that everyone can tread um yeah. and that's gonna be, and that's hard at first that's hard when you're the first one treading yes. that path right when you're the one that you're doing something and then everyone else is going to end up having to copy and, and mimic well dude because to, the, to your point, like if you're on the, not, I don't mean the out group, but if your tribe, let's say, if your group is the one that is um, at this point in time being canceled more or whatever, you know, if that's the conversation you want to have, if your tribe is being canceled more or attempted to be canceled more, the, the tension is, is when you see someone in the other tribe get canceled, you're like, it kind of feels good. It, you get a little bit of like a, a rush from it because you're like about time. It feels like retribution, right? But it's eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth stuff. It's not turn your cheek. And the thing is, you can't build. That was, a one, that was some of the responses. I, that's some of the responses I got to the Jimmy Kimmel thing. Like, good. Mm -hmm. Like, he's playing with these people. Play, you know, play stupid games, win stupid prizes, and this yeah. is what you want. And I was like, that's. Uh, I don't want that. I, I don't agree with it. Like, I think that I think that there's a better way of getting out of it. And I would rather win him as a convert than have him at burned at the stake as a heretic. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and that's what. Well, these people, what well, the in group that doesn't like the Jimmy Kimmels, uh, yeah, they're just going to cheer on the burning, right? They're going to cheer yeah. in the infighting and that kind of stuff. And I was like, I'd rather have them as a convert, right? Yeah. Um, that I think that's a it's a better win. It is. It is. It's a win. It is. It's the win, honestly. And it's it's yeah. deeply humanizing. And here's the deal: if it's deeply humanizing because it starts with an idea of love, and that's another like king idea, obviously. Like love is always creating, it's generating, it's not destroying. Like that's what hate does. Hate destroys. And when you think about it like that, when you think of someone who's, um, you may have wrote about this in your article, actually, I can't recall now, but when you talk about someone who's um, sinning, let's say, in some way, they're dehumanizing another person. Um, when you look at that as like, ooh, good guy and bad guy, that's a problem. You need to look at it as, oh, man, that is two people becoming less human right now. I want them to be fully human. And being fully human is like in Christ, and that means love your enemy, and that's the road in. And you get all these like, like you said, mimetic, mimetic is a way of thinking of it, but these feedback loops that are on the positive side that are creative because they're rooted in love, right? Um, but yeah, it's, it's um, otherwise, yeah, if it's rooted in hate, it, it, it can and only will destroy not just the other, yeah, it'll cancel outside, but it cancels the person themselves, like they're essentially de-evolving, right? Right, no, exactly. I mean, it, you, you've heard this quote, I'm sure, like, but bitterness and, and hate are, it's like drinking poison expecting the other person to die. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that's what's going on. Like, it's like, there's no, there's no good, uh, end to this as long as we're all engaging in it. It's the only way to not win. The only way to not lose this game is not to play it. Um, and so, but the, the nice thing is that we can, like people can walk away from playing the game. Um, and it's going to take some brave people at the beginning to do it. Um, but eventually like, if you get that critical mass and enough people doing it, then it just, there's a gravity to it. Cause you're like, Oh, there's just a weight off my shoulders that I don't have to play this hateful, angry, bitter game. Um, I don't have to like, I don't have to seek atonement for these things that can't atone. I don't have to carry around this burden. I don't have to be Martin Luther. Keep getting back in the confession line. Um, yeah. That's a beautiful, like freeing, like thing. Um, and it, it, it has weight that that's a, that's mimetically attractive to people. You yeah. just need enough people doing it. And so, um, so yeah, right, it's going to take some. There's a meaning crisis for sure that exists right now. And like the purposelessness you talked about earlier, where people are self-destructing through drugs and or suicide and all sorts of terrible things. But there's also a, a bravery epidemic, you know, you could call it where, yeah, if we have just a handful of people who do something that feels so contrary in the moment, but the feedback loop and the, uh, the felt reality, I think it will be like a nice dopamine hit because yeah, there's something 
human beings always look up to people that do brave things and heroic things. And if it's something like that, when it's a brave act of love, like there's, there's no way they can't be good. You know? Totally. I mean, the, the, the one that stands out to me, I can't, um, let's see. I believe it was a, it was a cop that went into the wrong apartment thinking it was hers. I think this is in Texas. There's a cop that went into a wrong apartment late at night. I, th I think, I think she, maybe she had had a drink or two or something like that. She, she came in and uh, thinking it was her apartment and shot the guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And then, um, so she gets, she gets, you know, uh, tried and, and gets found guilty. Um, and um, the, like the, I think it was the brother of the guy that was shot ends up coming and giving her a hug and the judge gave the woman a Bible. And you're just like, and some people were mad about that. Some people were mad yeah. that this guy like tried to comfort this woman who's going to prison for killing his brother. And, but he did it for Christian reasons. That was a, a act of love and he got criticized for it. We need more of that Yes. because it was beautiful. And it, if we get enough of that, then that becomes the norm. That becomes the way that we think that we're supposed to be. That becomes the attractive thing. And the other side starts to seem ugly by yes. comparison. Yeah. And so anyway, we need more of that. And that, that one just stands out to me because it was so like, that's the hardest thing to type of thing to forgive. Right. And it's such a moment. And, and, and he got criticized for it. Weirdly enough, he got plenty of praise for it too. And I think that's what people sure. should take away for it from it is that there's a lot of people that are looking for that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it takes some bravery and it takes like some enduring, like sometimes you do want revenge. Yes. Right. And, and so like, but you can overcome it. I mean, you don't think that Frederick Douglass didn't endure things actually yeah. being a slave. Like he saw people killed his family. As he's writing that letter, his sisters and his grandmother, I think, are still enslaved. Yes, um, to that, to, well, at least in connection to this guy. I don't remember if it was yes. actually in his house, but within his property or connections. That's right, right. Exactly. So when he's writing that letter, his, his, his family is still there. And he doesn't, he actually doesn't even know if they're alive or dead whether or not the guys killed them or anything else like that. And he still writes that letter. So doing it, that, that like radical act of love, even when being persecuted or even when being really wrong, that's the mimetic, that's the mimetic, you know, uh, attraction that we need to, we need more of. And it like, but one of those things where, you know, eventually you get big enough gravity and just pulls everything in. Yes. Um, and we've got the wrong kind of gravity, but it doesn't, it's not, there's nothing inevitable about that being there forever. Yeah. Well, I want to give you the last word here, but you're, you're reminding me of, um, well, I thought I've been trying to share with our people and more in our local context, and it's, it's right in with what you're talking about, Trip. and it's that we're in such a space right now, especially with the charged nature of things and, and so much of the quarantine that's going on, and just everyone's wanting to participate in society in whatever way they can, right? Um, in such a way, though, that to where no matter what you do in appro approaching any real problem or anything of significance, and even things of insignificance for that matter, but especially these things of significance, you will be hated by someone no matter what you do, even if you are 100% pure. And so there's some kind of a freedom in voluntarily accepting, I will be hated no matter what I do, so why don't I just be hated for trying to show radical love and compassion to as many people as possible? And in that yep. case, like that's what that young man did. And he, he was hated, like you're, you're right, by plenty of people as a traitor or not pure or whatever his problems or his accusations were. But you just accept that I'd rather be hated for that than all the other reasons I could be hated. For being vengeful, for buying, for letting that, like, that, that root of the serpent take hold of my life, you know. Um, I'd rather not be hated for that. I'd rather be hated for something else. You know? Totally. So. And yeah, and so I mean, this reminds me of, and, and I think people would think, well, I don't have anything that dramatic right, going on. You know, I, I can't give that kind of radical love right now because, like, my brother didn't just get killed or whatever. And hopefully, mm -hmm. none of us have anything of that magnitude happen to us um, that that we even have the opportunity to do it because it's awful to go through. Um, but it reminds me of a. Um, it reminds me of a, a Lord. I don't know if you're a Lord of the Rings fan. Not um, the big. I don't. I don't dislike it. I'm just not a huge. But okay. go on. Yeah. There's a lot of fans uh, out there. Yeah. So, um, but th there's um, there's a scene where Galadriel, who's a really powerful elf, is talking to Gandalf. You know, the wizard, um, and she's asking why why Frodo, right? Why why did you choose this little bitty tiny hobbit to be the one to carry this burden, right? And like, why the halfling? She calls him. Yeah. And he says, um, Saruman believes, Saruman's the evil wizard, um, 
that that um, ends up being a traitor. Um, he said, Saruman believes that it's only great power that can hold evil in check, but that is not what I found. I found is the small everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay, small acts of kindness and love. So don't look for big dramatic things. Just be kind. Just be forgiving. Like the next time you're in a grocery store, you're in the car and someone cuts you off and whatever, like it, just practice it there. Right, practice it where you're at, right in front of you. Don't worry about making these big dramatic. There's another critique I have of the activist is that it has to be big and dramatic because it's about you, not the other person. And so the, the thing about kindness and love is that it's about the other person and not you. So don't mm -hmm. look for big dramatic things. Just be kind to the person that's right in front of you in whatever small way you can. And just practice that, just do that over and over and over again. And then you'll find, I think that I think the, the people that I see that do this most, everyone wants to be around them, right? Everyone wants, like, they have a gravity to them. And then you want to be like them in some ways. And then you get into the, like, Paul, imitate me as I imitate Christ type of thing. Mm -hmm. Just do that. Just practice that. Don't look for big showy versions of it. If something presents itself to you, obviously do it. But don't worry about being big and dramatic about it because it's not about you. It's about the other person. If we make it about the other person and helping them, then you don't have, you're not even tempted with this toxic hate and like who's, I'm, oh, I'm glad he's gotten canceled because you're worried about him, right? Yeah. Not you. It's not about you at all. Um, so that's, that's the framework that I would, and like, just, just do it in your everyday life. Do it with your kids. Do it with your wife. Do it with your coworkers. Just do it there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good word. I appreciate you. How can people follow you, Trip, and stay up? You're, you're the sharpest, most philosophical computer engineer I've ever met, man. I know a lot of them where <laughs> I, I live. And... I'm, yeah. I am weird in that way. I like I like my <laughs> I like my philosophy and my theology. Um, yeah, well, I so know that you're mo normally not tweeting about computer engineering, so you're tweeting about no, this I, stuff. I, yeah, I, I used to I used to tweet a lot about engineering, but then I, I have separate accounts that I do that from because yeah. I because otherwise I I get like I'm always irritating some someone if I tweet about <laughs> philosophy or theology or politics, and the computer engineers are like, I don't care about this. Stop it. If I could tweet, oh, here's a cool new machine learning back propagation algorithm. Everyone's like. <laughs> talking about this is dumb um and so anyway but yeah so uh on you could probably the easiest way is follow me on twitter uh trip t-r-i-p-p -P, underscore p is my handle so i, I anything that i write or podcast that i do i usually i'll just post them there so that's where you can find me all right we'll link all of that in the show notes i appreciate your time today though all right thank you yeah you have a great day later trip see ya